Uh, Mark, welcome. Thank you very much, Paul. Good to see you again. Lovely to see you. I think we should say a big well done to Christie's because this room looks Look, fantastic. Well done it? to Christie's. Really really great. Great. Yeah. You've, uh, <clears throat> you've done this before. I have. <laughs> yeah. So, did you, what I'm curious to know is, did you take some persuading to go ahead with this project or did you do it willingly? Did you come willingly? <laughs> to give away so many of the collection. I came quietly. Yeah. I think that, you know, that, uh, I, I, had to, I mean, I've had to go on asking myself questions right up till, till now, till yeah. to, to, to today. And I actually, when I came in, because I'd never been in, uh, when I came in this afternoon, I must admit a couple of the things that I saw did make me gulp mm. a little bit. But, um, and, uh, I, you know, I'm going to wish that I was taking them home with me, but... At the same time, I'm happy. It's a kind of a happy pain because, you know, that they'll go to people who, hopefully, uh, will 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 have new friends. You know, will make new relationships with them. And uh, I remember Chet Atkins telling me, you know, you get a guitar, Mark. Your guitar is your friend for life, yeah. and um, it'll be your best friend. I wasn't really thinking so much at the time, but I've had plenty of time to think about that since. And, and it is, you know, it's a wonderful companion to you, and I'm sure a lot of you will know that already. I mean, you talk about them like people. They, they are sort of like members of the extended family, aren't they? Yeah, well, uh, you know, anybody that's uh, been unfortunate enough to work in the studio with me will know that you're looking for characters for songs, you're looking for a voice in the song. You, they all have a different voice, you know, so that's just the funny thing about it. They're, they don't conform to uh, what you'd think. You'd just think, what is this? Just two bits of wood, isn't it? And, and uh, the guitarists in here will know very, very, very well that that's just not the way it plays at all. Yeah. That they're characters and there will be a song that answers, you know, for them, for just for that one thing. And I was looking at a, one of them. It was the, a blue Echo 300 that, you know, uh, and, and it just cold, covered in sparkle. And it looks more like something you'd find at a kid's party or something. You'd get out of a swizzle stick. You know? <laughs> and... Uh, but that was a song for Sonny Liston. It had the song written all over it. And when I played the song on that instrument, it worked. And, you know, I mean, I would do it on a Les Paul or different guitars for different nights. But on, at the time when we were doing the record, that, that, was, the, that was the guitar for, for it. It's a character. It's like finding a character for a, for a play. Mm. You know, it's the same, it's the same thing, and, it, and it's like casting yeah. people for a, for a song, casting musicians for a, for, a, for a song. I mean, I remember when I wrote a thing called uh, Sailing to Philadelphia, I suddenly heard James Taylor singing The Other Guy. Mm. And poor old James, you know, he, he, didn't, he didn't ask for that. <laughs> and he didn't mind it, though. I happen to know that he didn't mind. <laughs> he did, great. So you are sort of casting the guitar, aren't you? Yeah. In, so yeah. does the song always exist first before you start thinking about casting the guitar? Or does the, sometimes it's the other way around and the guitar sort of... You get, yeah, well, you get to know your instrument, Paul. You get to know it. You know, you play it so much that you think, ah, this is a job for a, a 1954 Fender Stratocaster with thick strings and a tremolo arm. Can you really hear it? You can really hear it in, in your head? Yeah, except that it could also be a Gretsch 6120 <laughs> from 1957. <laughs> and, and I'm serious. It could be one of those two guitars. And people who have studied this stuff for whatever God-forsaken reason <laughs> will know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But you can really cast, uh, call those to mind, uh, yeah. the individual tones of yeah. the guitars. In fact, the 6120 for, for the train spotters, uh, the Shads did actually use a 6120 for some of their records. Yeah. And, 
and it was indistinguishable from the Fender, actually, at the time, because they were very similar pickups. And in 1957, the, the Gretsch Filtertron pickups, they changed them. And so I won't even look at a 6920 after 1957. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned the shares, because in, in many ways, this is all Hank Marvin's fault, isn't it? Everything we're looking at here, that's where it starts yes. for you, isn't it? A lot of it is. It's all the, always you can find a Geordie to blame for quite a lot of things. Yeah. But you told me the story many times about you know how the first guitar had to be a, a, a red strat. You wanted it to be a red strat because of Hank Marvin. So Shadows come along, made a huge impression on you, and then you start looking at these things in the, in the local guitar shop yeah. window, don't you? Uh -huh. Yeah, oh yeah. And uh, all the, you know, the cliches, nose up, nose up against the glass. And when I first actually managed to pick, pluck up the courage to take, uh, pick a guitar down from the wall, I can still see my hand reaching up tentatively to take down this Spanish guitar from the wall. And there were a couple of Geordie boys working in the shop, and one of them said, as I was lowering it carefully down, he said, you drop that, I'll drop you. <laughs> Learning on Tyneside, you know, it's... Yeah. It's but good advice. Uh, it didn't put me off. No. Um, and that started the whole thing, yeah. didn't it? That, that day, he really started the thing. I didn't, oh, but actually, Paul, I didn't even know how to hold a guitar. I didn't even know what to do with it. I didn't even know. I hardly even knew the difference between left hand and right hand. And, uh, what to, I just needed to be in touch with the thing. And there yeah. were some lads making them in the wood, woodwork room. I'm making solid body guitars in the woodwork room when I was at school, and I would just go down there just to be able to, to get a chance just to hold what, mm. the, a body, you know, to hold a, mm. to hold a fender shaped body or something like that. And yeah, it, it, yeah it's, uh, it's not probably not very healthy looked at, you know, um, over the years. <laughs> uh, my, I don't know what if there's any psychologists here who. Who could help? Could help me. <laughs> yeah. The first guitar you owned was not a Strat, was it? It was you, you, your dad kind of stepped up. Yeah, and... it was a copy. It was a Hofner <laughs> copy, fifty quid, which was a big stretcher in um, those days. And uh, I think those days it, uh, it, it was probably the equivalent of about a thousand now. Uh, you know, and I didn't know what to do with it. I, I didn't have the nerve to ask poor old dad for an amplifier because it'd been a stretch for the guitar. So I, I blew up the radio <laughs> in short order. Yeah. And then I was bor borrowing friends' acoustics, you know, and, and they were very often pretty rough acoustics with high action, which means the strings were a long way from the fingerboard. But I learned how to play them somehow. A finger pick uh, that you all know, like a claw hammer finger pick, was taught to me by a folk singer in Northumberland who was my pal's big sister's boyfriend. Joe Davidson was his name, and he taught me. My only guitar lesson was, was that, to, 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 to do that finger pick. <laughs> that was it, the only guitar lesson you ever had? Well, uh, the other one was my sister who suggested that I hold it the other way around. She, <laughs> she said, you know, that's, that's the way people play it, because I'm left-handed. So she, I was actually playing a tennis racket, and she switched it around and said, you play it like that. And so she made me a right-handed guitar player on a tennis racket, um, and I'm glad that she did, because I had quite a strong left hand then. And um, uh, so I could, could do those things where I could take three strings and strangle them, you know, do things with them. It'd give you extra dexterity, perhaps, yeah. here and there. Um, that might have helped, I think. I, I think doing everything wrong, being a guitar teacher's nightmare, mm. has advantages, you know. <laughs> um, you know, that you just find your own answers. I've always, as my old headmaster said, gone my own way. <laughs> In spite yes. of all good advice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I mean, you used to get in trouble at school for not paying attention and sort of playing yeah. guitar runs on the... I'd be the one going... And awfully, when you stop making that horrible metallic sound at the back of your voice, <laughs> back of your throat, boy, what is that? And um, rock and roll, sir. <laughs> Get out. Yes. <laughs> Funny enough, though, you, you, when you came to performing for the first time, as you sort of hinted at before, you kind of went down the folk route, didn't you, yeah. first? Well, it was economic. I couldn't <coughs> afford an amp. I was just happy to be playing, you know. And, 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 of course, I was exposed to everything. I was exposed to to everything from Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, to all the way through the folk easel, um, you know, and lots and lots of stuff with playing electric and acoustic. So, do, you know, advancing on that double front was a big advantage, I think. And mm. I didn't see it that way at the time. I just was, because, you know, kids are always frustrated. Yeah. Always, you know, anxious to get going and get moving and get out of my way. But <laughs> It's a good thing that I, I had that little as, uh, aspect. The frustration is yeah. important. Well, I know you, you have always said how grateful you were for the fact that when the Straits made it, when Dire Straits made it big, you'd, you'd had that education, that long period. You know, you were a little old. This is one of the ways in which the business has changed so much, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you'd done all those years of the hard, the 10,000 hours or whatever you would call it, you know. Yeah. Um, so you're more prepared for it, perhaps? Well, I, I think it's different nowadays. So a friend of mine on the record company in America was telling me he was showing a young band, the singer of a young band that they'd signed, you know, his first tour. He said, there's your first tour. He said, it's 29 shows. And the kid goes, 29 shows? He said, I didn't get into this to work. <laughs> and, you know, John and I had done 250 shows that year, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, so there is a different philosophy mm. now. I think there is a bit of a different philosophy. Yeah. All these early years, I mean, would you say that you became a, a, a sort of bit of a guitar connoisseur quite, quite early on? Were you studying, you know, all the different possibilities? Yeah, kids are horrible snobs. And we obviously lusted after the, the, grail, the grail objects. The Holy Grail objects were the Fender Strats and the Gibson Les Pauls, and the, you know you, you you learn a bit more as you go on, and you start specialising and branching off here and there, and people bring you instruments and uh, introduce you to instruments, and you hear instruments, and uh, thankfully um, the success meant that I could could go and buy a couple of them, but it wasn't for a long time. Mm. I mean, our first royalty check, I mean, I need John to remind me, but 18 months before we got anything, wasn't it? We were number one all over the world, but we were living in a council flat. Where, yeah. and, uh, where there's now a plaque on the wall, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, but John had sorted the meter, at least. <laughs> um, for Dire Straits, we were rehearsing in the council flat, and we, we had underlay on the walls, uh, whatever we thought that was going to do. <laughs> but the neighbors were surprisingly kind and patient, and uh, we somehow got from A to B. So I'm sure a lot of people will, will want me to ask you, in relation to this lovely exhibition, how you went about choosing which ones you were going to let go of. I mean, it feels like that must have been a very long process, was it not? Yeah, I've got a couple that I'm regretting. <laughs> Second thoughts, so, everybody. You know, when we said hello earlier on, you said I'm here to say goodbye to some friends. It's quite emotional, isn't it? it yes, uh, the the ones where you know you're saying goodbye and you've already made your peace with the fact that that that'll it'll be gone. That's all right. And when you're playing the the, the hits, you know, the, the, in the set and the ones that people are looking forward to, it, there are particular guitars that you have to. You kind of do. Him. You kind of have to. Just like there are particular, I hate to say it, but there are particular notes that you have to. Yeah. Um, um, because I don't, you know, I'll have remembered starting right in, say, Brothers and Arms. And you know how it, it, 
you know how it starts. It, it goes like this. Right. So, one, two, three, four, those four notes. I will have tried it hundreds of times on stage to play something else <laughs> and failed each time. So what I would end up doing was play those notes so that everybody would know. Because as soon as you do that, well, it's yours now. You be careful with that. <laughs> You'd, you know, as soon as you played those notes, you, everybody, ah, they know where they are. And it doesn't matter. And then I realized after a little bit that I could then start to improvise and maybe play something else. But not those three, if it's not those notes, mm. if I'd started with did, did, do, do, yeah. Yeah. It, it's not it, you know? And so the, you start to realize that the, first, the, 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 the improvised bit that gave you the song, the version of the song in the first place has become part of the furniture of the thing and it's become, and you know that's become an important part of people in people's minds. Yeah, and it's the same thing with, with uh, Sultans, isn't it? As you've often said, Sultans when you get same. to that bit, and everyone knows the bit I'm talking about near the end of yeah. Sultans, the yeah. motif. Um, you know, I've tried, believe me. <laughs> yeah. And I remember once I got home and said, "Oh, something was, was weird about Sultans tonight." And Kitty said, "Did you do your twiddly bits?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "No." She said, "Well, there you are then." Yeah. And if you don't play it, then people have come out, spent money, parked cars, bought sandwiches. <laughs> and you realize, of course, you know, people have given something back to what they love, you know, they love. And that's why they're, they're there to celebrate. And it's the performance is an important celebration. For, yeah. It's a mutual thing of coming together with the people that want to be there when you're playing it yeah. for them. But it's and also you, try and make, you, try and, you try and give it something else as well. Of course, yeah. you, it's another reality. So, so I'm very conscious when, I'm, when I would be starting Brothers in Arms, this is the reason why people are, are here. Mm. You know, that's one of the reasons why. So it better be bloody good. Yeah, yeah. And it's also about recreating, not just playing the song and doing it the way people are expecting, but it's recreating the actual tone, isn't it, of the... Yeah. Of the record? Um, or at least, I mean, often thinking about the same, w w whichever guitar you played on the recording. No, it's not about, it's not about the rec recording. It starts to become something else ap apart from the recording. Mm. And actually, when you hear the recording, when you've been on tour for, a year, you know, for it seems like a year, yeah. and you hear the, the record, you go, oh, my God. <laughs> it sounds a bit straight. Yeah, it? yeah. It, 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 so it does become something else. So that's the ongoing thing is keep it fresh, yeah. find something in it that's real. Yeah, yeah. And that's all that we tried to do. Do you ever hear a, an old track of yours back and think, in terms of the, the, the choice of guitar, do you ever go, oh, actually, maybe that wasn't the right one? Yeah, um, oh, God, God, yeah. and else? the keys. Yeah. yeah. All sorts of horrible things that you don't want to know about. <laughs> no. Yes, we do. <laughs> oh, I mean. I remember there's a song called Why Worry. Mm. I don't know, we used to call it Why Bother. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was just too damn high for me, you know. Mm. So you make those mistakes, but you make them in public, you know, and then you just get so you, you've just got to quit worrying about it and get on with it. That's it, yeah. Um, you've got a new album on the way. Um, more details to come on that, you know, not, not too far away. but. It's a wonderful record, I've heard it already. Are there new guitars on that album? Are there, uh, have you relied on some old friends, or is it a mixture? Yeah, a, there, there is a new acoustic guitar maker in Oregon um, called uh, Butch Boswell, Arthur Boswell, and, and uh, I bought a couple of them already, and you know, I've got there already. Thanks to, again, to Rudy, my friend Rudy in New York, who you all know about. And he goes, Marcus, I hear this amazing guitar you got. I, got, I, buy, I get you one. And um, that's Rudy. And, uh, 
and uh, you gotta hear this guitar, man. So, um, yeah, so Butch Boswell, who was Rudy's repairman for a long time, he was doing his 10,000 hours. Right, yeah. Doing that. And now he can make them, he makes beautiful, beautiful guitars. So it just suited me, and I found one little guitar in that lot that ended up being on four or five yeah. songs on the new album. Yeah. yeah. So yes, so the same thing starts happening. Yeah. You know, things worm their way into the, you know, they yeah. just end up in the garage and being used, yeah. yeah. So you're still building the collection, really, aren't you? Yeah. Exactly that. <laughs> Rudy wanted to come over. He, he, wa he wanted to bring me a guitar. Really? <laughs> and, you know, I've got a picture of it on my phone. It is a blue, gui a blue guitar. That sums it all up. And he wanted to bring it because he was excited about it. And, and I've got a, a new one from New Boswell as well the other day. And uh, I was showing it to one of the kids the other day. And, Getting excited about it all again. So yeah, the, it just that, that doesn't stop. No, no. it's just re it's renewing itself all the time, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, the whole thing. You must be very curious to know what's going to happen you know, on, the, on the day of the auction. I'll be fine. You know, I'm on a, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Turning to therapy, isn't it? It's a therapy session. <laughs> I know, but there there are some real beauties in there. You yeah. know, there are some real crackers. Yeah, yeah. Oh, tell me a story about this one. We had a specific thing or two about this oh, lovely, well, that, lovely I mean, beast here. That was Mandela, <coughs> and I remember um, going out. Uh, as we were going out to get on the stage, I remember somebody saying, "There's over 650 million people watching this." <laughs> It was food for thought. Yes. That is, a crowd like that makes know, you yeah. think, yeah. But then you were veterans of Live Aid by then, so, you know. Well, yes, we were sort of used to it, I, I suppose. And mm. the, the funny thing about Live Aid is we were doing a kind of a residency at the Wembley Pool at the... Yeah, at the um, arena. The arena. And I don't know how many gigs we were doing there. 20 or so. Mm. And... All we had to do was cross the car park and do the let's do, do live, live aid. aid. Yeah, yeah. So we just walked across the car park, did live aid, yeah. walked back, and did the gig at the, uh, <laughs> at the arena. Yeah, yeah. It's two gigs in one day. Well, in those stadium years, and I know you're much happier now in playing smaller places, aren't you? Generally, but w were there certain guitars that you would that a, a fit a bigger st stadium? Setting. I mean, is that part of the consideration? No, I think or? it would be the same. They're just the right thing for the song. Yeah, it's the right thing for the song all, all the time. You know, it's whatever it is. And you don't need too many. You don't need certainly don't need as man, many as I've been using. <laughs> um, and on, on a gig, I might go get through uh, six or seven guitars. But the reason why the pencil, the Rudy the Rudy came along was because I was looking to find a way of using less guitars on the set so I could get a powerful sound, like a thick pickup you see by the mm. bridge. Mm. And that's a humbucking, really powerful pickup. Mm. And the single pole pickups in front were more like Fender pickups. Mm. And um, it, I was just trying to get more sounds out of one instrument so I didn't have to keep jumping around. and. Um, and some of the nicest sounds you get are the blends between the, the pickups at the back of the, where the, where the bridge is, the harder sounds, and, and the ones at the front end, which are softer and more pillowy, and you can get tones between them. But then I found out that you can get a lot of different sounds from a Les Paul, too. And it, if you know, if you can be bothered, which I couldn't for a long time, but if you can be bothered to learn how the volume controls actually work <laughs> together and, and the tone controls actually work, that you can actually get some proper effects out of the guitar and get it to, the guitar to work for you a little bit better instead of just turning everything full on, which was my speciality. You know? <laughs> and it's a much better way that you can work with a Les Paul. Yeah. And I had to learn that. Mm. Um, and probably, you know, my old guitar techs would be sitting there thinking, 
Now he tells us. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know, Ron, I know, but just leave it. I'm, <laughs> I'm buying. Yeah. Um, no, uh, no, uh, you know, it, it's a very slow learning process, and, and I, didn't, I didn't have the money for a good Les Paul for a long time, and, uh, you know, uh, so it, it was slow, it was slow. Mm. But that was the main perk of success for you, wasn't it? The, the ability to, to start owning some of these things you'd been um, fantasizing about for so long? Yeah, it was, it's really exciting to get to know them that way. Yeah. You know, and to, to have had the chance. So I didn't know what all the fuss was about until I saw what all the fuss was about. Mm. Um, and it's an endlessly fascinating thing to be part of. It goes on. It goes on. Mystery goes on. Yeah. Mark, it's lovely to see you. I just want to let everybody know about the exhibition, which is here at Christie's in King Street until the 30th of January. Um, so please do enjoy having a look oh, around. Yeah. and come Tell around. your friends, have, come and have a look. Come around. Yeah. Uh, the auction is in this room, 1 p.m., 31st of January, uh, and it's going to be live streamed on Christie's.com and on YouTube as well. Um, I think all that remains is to ask everyone to join me in saying a great big thank you to Mark Knopfler. Thank you very much. Thank you.